We are wrapping up our current sermon series that we've been in for four weeks now, A Taste of Heaven on Earth, Principles That Make This Possible. And Romans 14, all of Romans 14, and the first half of chapter 15 are really essentially all about living on mission. There was disunity inside the church at Rome. I know that's surprising you. Churches that don't always agree and don't always get along. Anybody shocked at that right there? There was some disunity. There was some disharmony inside the church at Rome. But Paul here is pleading with them. He's begging with them, challenging them to preserve the sacred spirit of the church. To remember, it's not just about here and now. It's not just about each other. We are called to something greater and bigger than ourselves. We are called to glorify God. We're called to show the world who he is. And one of the ways he wants to do that is through the church. And so essentially Paul's saying, live on mission. Don't forget about the big picture. You can get along even when you disagree. And my name can be seen and people can be saved and lives can be transformed for God's honor and for God's glory. That's what we've been talking about for the past three weeks. And this morning, we are going to wrap it all up with one last message. And it's called this, a glorious reality, a glorious reality, a taste of heaven on earth can be a glorious reality reality in our lives. Now, to help us illustrate this, I want to talk a little bit about my own family and our own situation. This past week, my wife and I thought we were going to have the opportunity to be basically all alone for a whole week. We sent three of our kids off to camp, and our oldest son, he works, and he can take care of himself. And so essentially, we were going to have the week to ourselves, and it was going to be great. And then poor Scarlett got sick with a fever, and she had to come home. But we still had plans, and we persevered through, and we were still able to spend a lot of time together, and we had a wonderful week, and we were able to do most of the things that, that we wanted to do to celebrate our anniversary. Now, I bring all this up just in order for you to really understand where I'm going. you got to understand a little bit about our family dynamics, all right? So years ago, Lana and I did uh, one of those personality tests, you know, that you can take out there, and we discovered that she is a successful achiever, and I am an entertaining optimist, Anybody surprised by that right there? And when you put these two personalities together inside of a marriage, what you get is um, a whole lot of energy. I think that's the best way that we can describe it. I think to help you describe like our marriage and how it works, just think of the weather in Florida, okay? Florida is the sunshine state. Thank God for that. It is sunny. It's a beautiful place to live. But you all know those afternoon thunder showers that pop up every now and then? You know what I'm talking about? The ones that you like, the temperature drops 15 degrees, you run for cover and hide. That's a little bit about what our relationship's like sometimes, all right? Um, Just to give you a case in point, the other night we were actually Thursday, we were coming back home from Atmore. There is, it it is worth the drive to Atmore, Alabama. There's a restaurant there called Gather. Very good restaurant, all right? It's worth the drive. So we're coming back from that and we go through one of those torrential downpours. I mean, it's like one of those things, it feels like it dumps five gallons of water in like 10 minutes. And so you could feel it. You know, like the energy picks up and I knew we were getting in. I said, you better buckle up. We're about to go through some crazy stuff. And sure enough, we get in there and it starts getting totally crazy on the outside. Then all of a sudden, it starts getting crazy on the inside too. She's like, turn your windshield wipers up higher. You're going too fast. Can you even see? And I'm like, you better just be quiet right now. (laughs) And then to top it all off, to top it off, that's already getting me. It's I'm already anxious. Now I'm getting anxious and worked up inside. Then my gas light goes off. Like the one that says you're almost out of gas. And for whatever reason in my car, it doesn't go off until you're like 12 miles away from being empty. (laughs) And we were on one of those stretches of road where we were about 12 to 14 miles from the next gas station that comes up. And I'm like, It's raining cats and dogs. You can't see. Now all of a sudden she's like, how could you let us run out of gas like this in the middle of the rain? And I was like, you better be quiet right now. (laughs) And literally eight minutes later, we're sitting at a gas station. The sun is back out. The storm is behind us and all the happiness is back again. That, That is a little bit about the two of us. Well, guess what we did? We had children, four of them. And they're a lot like their mom and dad. There is a whole lot of energy and passion in our home. And it's a little crazy at times. And everybody has to get their word in. And everybody has to let their opinion be known. And everybody likes to have the last word. Anybody want to come over for lunch today? It's a lot of fun. It really is. And so, yeah, the thought of just a few days alone, some peace and quiet. Oh, man, a taste of heaven on earth, right? Any other parents can relate to that right there? But what do you as parents do when you get all alone and you don't have your kids? What do you do? 
you talk about how much you miss your kids. And you talk about how much you miss your family. And here's where I'm going with all of this. I want you to understand this morning that God did not create us to do life alone. God did not create us to do life alone. And as complicated and as challenging as all of our family dynamics can be at times, can I tell you, there is nothing like the glory of all six of us being at home together. When the kids came back from camp, the two boys got back and we ate dinner on Friday night and had breakfast yesterday morning. There's nothing like the glory that comes from your family being all together. And can I tell you this morning, as complicated and as challenging as the family dynamics inside the church, the family of God, as complicated and as challenging as they can be, there is no greater glory than doing life together for a cause and for something that's bigger than ourselves and that's bigger than today and that's bigger than the here and now. There's nothing greater than lifting high the name of Jesus and pointing people together and pointing people towards him for his honor and for his glory. God did not create us to do life alone. A taste of heaven on earth can be a glorious reality in our lives. And this passage here, Romans chapter 15, is Paul's conclusion on everything he said in chapter 14. And I got five practical applications, and we are going to go right through these, and we're going to have communion at the end. And I'm just excited about how God's word brings everything together. And I'll tell you what, if you've missed this series... Obviously, the context of Romans 15 goes into everything that we've been talking about into the dynamics within the church. But can I tell you, you can apply these five principles to any area of your life, and you will taste heaven on earth. These are just practical examples that are going to help all of us. So a taste of heaven on earth can be a glorious reality in the church if we, number one, love others. If we love others. Look at verse 1 of chapter 15 with me. All right, I'm going to have you guys filling in the blanks, okay? So here we go. We then that are ought to bear the infirmities of the, and not to, what's it say, the last two words? And not to please ourselves. Paul's calling out the strong here. We've been going back and forth between the weak and the strong, and Paul says to the strong, you ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. It only makes sense that he would challenge the strong to look out for those who are weak and those who are weak in the faith. Now, I'll just ask you an important question right off the bat here. What kind of a person sees someone who has a need, has the ability to meet that need, but ignores that need or does nothing about that need? What kind of a person is that? That's a selfish person. Who's selfish? Can I be honest with you? I'm selfish. We all are selfish. The Bible teaches us that. By nature, we are sinners, and we naturally look out for our own good, and we naturally look out for ways to please ourselves and not to please others. And it is very easy for us to justify just living our lives, doing things for ourselves, and forgetting about the other people that God's placed in our life. But as a child of God, as somebody who's been saved by the amazing grace of God, he is commanding us and telling us to live differently. Stop thinking about ways to please yourself and start looking out for ways to be a help and a blessing to others. He builds on this in verse 2. He says, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. The way that you live out your faith as a child of God is by living for others, by looking for ways to build one another up, to edify, to encourage, and to help people be strengthened in their walk with God and in their faith with him. How many of you like encouragers in your life? You like those people that come along and have a positive word? How many of you like to be encouraged even when you know you've messed up and you have no reason to be encouraged? And those people that come along and they speak truth and mercy and grace into your life. That's what God's calling us to be. This past Monday night, Alana and I had the opportunity to go to um, our Coven Clean coming clean recovery, they had an appreciation dinner for all of those that work in that ministry on Friday nights. Can I tell you, I am so thankful for our addiction recovery program that that meets up here every single week. Those people that are involved in that ministry, they do exactly what verse 1 is talking about here in, in chapter 15. They bear the infirmities. They bear the weaknesses of the weak. Strong Christians 
come along. They extend a helping hand to help people who are struggling and are having a difficult time get to a strong footing in their life and in their faith and in their relationship with God. And can I tell you, God's done some amazing things in people's lives through our recovery program on Friday nights. Well, the highlight of that night was uh, Mark, who leads our program and does a great job, he had everybody go around the room and just share a testimony about how they got involved in the ministry and uh, what led them to it. And man, there is a group of faithful people that give up every single Friday night. Well, one of the testimonies that, that really stuck out in my mind was um, one of the husbands whose wife comes up here and works. He doesn't come up here and work, but she comes up here and works. And one of the things that he said was, when I found out that she wanted to come up here on Friday nights, Every single Friday night, I was like, no way. Just think about how, how many of you are willing to give up a Friday night? Not just one Friday night, but every single Friday night. That's a huge sacrifice. That, that's somebody that's not thinking about how to please themselves, but somebody that's truly doing what this verse is talking about, looking at how to help and encourage and build others up. But God dealt with his heart in such a profound way because he remembered before he knew Jesus, it was God who used his wife, who was his girlfriend at that time, to help him to get to a place where he could stand, to help him get to a place where ultimately he came to church and he trusted Jesus as a savior. And he said, if God used her to do that in my life, how can I be selfish and stop him from using her in somebody else's life? Do you understand what it is that we're talking about here? God's not called us to please ourselves. He's called us to live for others and to please others. Man, when was the last time you sacrificed? When was the last time you went out of your way to minister to somebody else and to help point them to Jesus and to help somebody who is weak come along and be built in their faith? Man, we can, this, this can be a glorious reality, this taste of heaven on, on earth in the church if we love others. Secondly, if we follow Jesus... If we follow Jesus, look at verse 3. What's it say here in verse 3? It says, for even Christ, what are those next three words? Please not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. This is a direct quote from Psalm 69.9. And do you know what the Bible's saying here? That the reproaches and the insults that people leveled against God Christ came to this earth and he took them upon himself. And I don't want to just leave it there impersonal at people and putting it off myself. My reproaches, my insults, my faults, my failures, my shortcomings, ultimately my rebellion against God, my sin against God. Jesus Christ, God's son, he came to this earth and he did not seek to please himself, but he looked to step in and he looked to help me and he took my reproach upon himself and he bore it upon the cross. What's amazing to me about Jesus is he had the power not to be reproached. He had the power to not suffer. He had the power to not serve. But he willingly humbled himself and became a man and went to a cross so that I can be saved. In just a few minutes, we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper today. And I think about the elements that are in here. We're going to eat a little wafer. That's, that's a representation of the bread, the body that was broken. We're going to drink some juice, which is a reminder of the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross. Do you understand this morning that we are all sinners? We fall short of God's glory, and he took our reproach. He took our sin. I love what Michael said when he opened up the service today. He can barely even get the words out. He will never get over the day that he got saved because he knew how sinful he was, but he knew what God delivered him from, and God turned his life upside down. Has God turned your life upside down? Oh, I'm not convinced. Has God turned your life upside down? Man, if you're saved... You are delivered. You are set free because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Now you put all of this in context. Follow Jesus. This is the practical application. What we give up for each other is nothing. You know what, you know what Paul's saying here right now this morning? He's saying to the Roman Christians, you can't give up your meat. You can't give up your wine. 
You can't give up how you want to celebrate or not celebrate days for the sake of others. Look at what God's son gave up on your behalf. Look what he says to us. You, you can't give up your personal preferences. You can't get over your bad attitude. You can't get over your hurt feelings. You can't get over your pride, your desire to be right, your anger at the church, your anger at other people. You can't give that up when Jesus Christ went to a cross and he bore our reproach and our suffering and our shame. No, he's saying, put this all in context. Yes, love others. Yes, it's gonna cost you. Yes, there's gonna be sacrifice, but follow the example that Jesus set in our lives. How can we not? Next. If we're going to experience this glorious reality, love others, follow Jesus, learn scripture. Look at verse four. He says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, Paul's writing to many Jewish believers and many Gentile believers, and it was Easy for the Jewish believers, those early on, and even for those who did not convert to Christianity, to believe that Paul's teaching undermined the Old Testament, because he says we're set free from the law. And so they believe that his teaching undermined the Old Testament. And there's actually many people even today that would say that the Old Testament is irrelevant, that we're living under the New Testament. And Paul's saying here in this verse, he's saying, there's nothing that could be further from the truth. Everything that was written before was written for our learning. And, and then he goes on in this verse. I love it, okay? But look back in verse four with me. He says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through, what's the next word? And of the scriptures might have hope. Paul's saying every single thing that was written before is written for our learning. And as we learn, and for instance, he just quoted Psalm 69 9 in verse three. As we learn about Jesus and as we learn about his sufferings and his reproaches, you know what that does? It gives us patience to endure. You know what it does when we think about Jesus and what he did for us on the cross? It comforts us. And as we begin to experience the patience and the endurance that we need, and as we begin to experience the comfort that we need to get through this life, you know what it produces? Hope. And you know what hope produces? Hope produces patience and comfort. And comfort and patience produce hope. And it's this cyclical process that keeps repeating itself over and over and over again. And you know what Paul's saying? He's saying, listen, a glorious reality. You can love others. You can follow Jesus if you get into the scripture and you learn God's word. The scripture was given for our learning. Man, I think about the Old Testament specifically. There's some great lessons to be learned from people there, right? How many, how many of you think the nation of Israel, you can learn a whole lot of lessons from the nation of Israel? <laughs> I don't know about you. When I look at the Old Testament and I think about Israel's problems, I'm like, man, they got some problems. How could they not get it and see it? And then God always convicts me and he says, man, you got problems. How can you not get it and how can you not see it? I think about the nation of Israel and I think about how God called them to be separate and holy and how he wanted to bless them and yet they wanted to be like the world around them. And how did that work out for them? Every single time God's people don't embrace the call of holiness and the call of being separate from the world and we long to be like the world that's around us, it ends in destruction, it ends in disaster, it ends in hard lessons that have to be learned as we go through life. Hey, learn from Israel. Learn from the Old Testament saints. You know, there's so many of them. I'm not, I'm not even going to mention any of them by name today, but I'll tell you this. If you go start reading your Bible and you start finding individual people in the Bible who are full of faith, you will be encouraged. You know why? You're going to find out that they're people just like you and me. They're not these super saints that don't have any problems. There's some Old Testament Christians and believers that had some major problems in their life and messed up big time. And you know what? God forgave them and God used them and they got back up and they got things right in their life. And as they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus and as they kept following God, God blessed them in incredible ways and you can be encouraged and you can find strength to endure as you read the Bible and as you read the scriptures. Hey, you know what's especially awesome about the Old Testament? <laughs> you know what everything in the Bible points to? It points to Jesus Christ 
and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. As you go through the Old Testament, one of the overarching themes that you're going to find there is the worship in the temple and the sacrificial system. A sacrifice had to be made. We're sinners, and there's nothing you can do to pay for your sin. There's absolutely nothing that we can do to save ourselves. You can't be a good enough person. You can't go to church enough. You can't give enough money. We are broken. We are sinners. And it's only through the sacrifice of another and through the Old Testament, there was lamb after lamb after lamb that was shed. And in the New Testament, in John, when Jesus comes onto the scene, John the Baptist sees Jesus and he introduces him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. Man, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning, we are reminding ourselves that he was the ultimate sacrifice that paid for our sins once and for all. Hey, can I tell you this morning, if, if I'm talking right now and you don't fully understand everything that I'm talking about, and you don't know for sure that, that Jesus is your Savior, that you have a relationship with him, the gospel is simple. We are sinners. I don't have to convince you of that, I'm sure. We know that we are broken people. Okay, we know it. There's a punishment for our sin. The Bible clearly teaches us. That's death. The punishment for sin is death. Death in the Bible is eternal separation from God forever in a real place called hell. I believe heaven's real. I believe hell is real. I believe that we're going to live for eternity. We all have never to die souls. And the punishment for our sin is eternal separation from God forever in hell. But the good news is Jesus Christ came and what did he do? He died on the cross. The punishment for your sin was death. And on the cross, he died, and he took your place, and he took my place. And in a few minutes, when we get to the, the part of the Lord's Supper where we pray, and we eat the bread, and we drink the juice, that's specifically for people who have trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And one of the reasons why we do this in remembrance of him is so that we point people who don't know for sure that Jesus is their savior to the ultimate sacrifice. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to fight with your sins anymore. God paid for them through his son Jesus on the cross. And if you put your faith and trust in him, you can be forgiven. You can be justified. There is no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the challenge is going to be simple. For those of us who are saved, we're going to remember. And for those of you that don't know Jesus... Hey, today you can put your faith and trust in him and you can be forever saved because he paid for your sins on the cross. Hey, this book will give you every single answer to every single scenario in life that you could ever possibly go through. Learn scripture. Number four, pray accordingly. Pray accordingly. This glorious reality of heaven on earth in our relationships with the church, man, it can be experienced if we love others if we follow Jesus, if we learn scripture, if we pray accordingly. Look at verse 5. He says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Paul had done everything in his power that he knew he could do up to this point. All of chapter 14, man, he says, receive one another. He says it's possible to do opposite things to the glory of God. He says, don't judge one another because God's going to be your ultimate judge. He says, don't destroy the work over God, over non-essential things. Pursue peace. Hey, don't please yourself. Please others. Follow the example of Jesus. He said everything that there is to say. We have all the knowledge. And you know what now he does? He now does the greatest thing that we could ever do that will make this become a reality. He prays. And he says, now. The God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one another according to Christ Jesus. Do you know what will make a like-mindedness with each other a reality? Do you know what will enable us to genuinely lift high the name of Jesus and to impact this community for Christ? It is the power of God that he grants to us when we humble ourselves and pray. As a church... We've got to get on our knees. As individuals, we've got to get on our knees. When was the last time you got on your knees and you prayed and you said, God, help me to be like-minded with my brothers and sisters at West Florida Baptist Church because I want the world to see you? That's a prayer that every one of us should pray. I, I love that we're going through this passage even as we get close to our 51st anniversary. Hey, will you praise the Lord this morning for 51 years of God's faithfulness? Praise God for that. 51 years, and our church is growing, 
And we have an incredible spirit here that God has blessed us with. And I get amazed and I get overwhelmed at that every day. I don't want to lose that. I I want it to grow. I want us to become more united in our desire to glorify God with one mouth and one voice in our community. And the God of grace and peace and patience and mercy, he will grant that to us if we will get on our knees and if we will pray and if we will ask him to. This morning, in a little bit, when we, when we go to communion, let's pray and ask God to keep us united, to keep us united around the like-mindedness that we have according to Christ Jesus. That's how that verse ends. Do you understand that if we keep our focus singly-minded and we keep it off of the distractions that Satan wants to throw our way and we keep it on Jesus and what he did for us on the cross and how he changed us and how he loves us and how he's patient with us and we long to be more like him and we long to be united around that, God will unite us and he will bring us together and he will use us to do exactly what verse 6 is talking about. And look what it says. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, West Florida Baptist Church, let's pray accordingly that with one mind and one mouth, we glorify God. We point people to the truth, the worth, the beauty, the greatness of who he is. Is God great in your life? Is God worthy of worthy of your sacrifice, worthy of your time, worthy of you dying to yourself and taking up your cross and following him? Is he worthy of it? Yes. Is he worthy of you getting into his word and learning his truth so that you can share his goodness and his truth with others? Yes. He is a great God and he's worthy of it all. God, use us. Grant to us the ability to be like-minded and to getting your word out to a world that's in desperate need of it. And last but not least, hope expectantly. Hope expectantly. Look at verse 7. He says, Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. He brings this all back full circle. He started in Romans 14, verse 1, with receive one another, and now he says it again. Wherefore, based on all these things that I've said about Jesus and who he is, receive ye one another. Then in verse 8, why should we receive one another? Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. The reason we should receive one another, the reason that we've been received by God is because Jesus himself became a servant. And he became a servant and he came to this earth and he went to the cross to confirm all of the promises that he made to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And you know what he said to them? I'm going to make of you a great nation. And through that nation, all the world will be blessed. God has always been a God that hasn't just cared about just specific people. He cares about every single person in the entire world. And he would love nothing more than for every single person to put their faith and trust in Jesus. And he wants to extend his grace and his mercy to everybody so that they can choose whether they're going to believe or whether they're not going to believe. And look how he builds this out. Look at verse 9. He says, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. And now what he's going to do is he's going to go on and he's going to quote four different passages from the Old Testament. Four different passages that he goes back to. And you all are going to help me fill in the blanks, okay? As we go through this. So, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the, and sing unto thy name. This was King David in Psalms. His heart got so full of who God was that he wanted to confess the name of God among the Gentiles. He didn't want it just to stay inside his people and his nation. He wanted the world to know how great his God was. Look at verse 10. And again he saith, rejoice ye with his people. And then verse 11, and again Praise the Lord, all ye, and laud him, all ye people. These two passages are in the Old Testament where God's commanding the Gentiles to praise the Lord with his people Israel. Now, how could the Gentiles praise the Lord with his people Israel if they weren't part of his people? 
They're not going to praise the Lord that, that Israel gets to be part of something that they're not. No, they're praising the Lord because they get to have the same God and Father that the nation of Israel had themselves. And then in verse 12, look what he says. And again, he's going back to the Old Testament. Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Paul's writing to a church in Rome that's filled with Gentiles, that's filled with Jews. And he's reminding all of us that God has always been a God who's been far more concerned about just, than more than just the nation of Israel, but the entire world and the root of Jesse wasn't just going to be David, but the son that would come from David would ultimately be Jesus. And Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Jesus is the one who every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what he's doing is he's reminding the church in Rome that God has always been a God that is passionate about the world, about every kindred, about every tribe, every tongue, every nation, about every single person being able to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and King and Savior and Master and Father as God, as how he intended himself to be. That's what he's doing here. And then in verse 13, he says this, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. I love this. Now the God of hope. God isn't a God that you have to hope you can hope in him. God is a God of hope. You want hope? Go to God and believe that you're going to find hope. Anybody, does anybody struggle getting through life? Who, who in here has it just come easy to you, man? It's just like a piece of cake. You get up every day and everything just falls perfectly in place. If you're like that, please see me on the way out. I want to know what your secret is, okay? What I know to be the reality of everybody in here is we struggle. It's a fight. Life is challenging. And you know what we need? We need hope, and God is a God of hope. And if we go to God believing that he can provide us hope, you know what he says? that you will abound in hope, that says he will fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope. It's the same thing that we looked at before. If you go to God believing that you can find hope, he'll give you joy and rejoicing. And as you get joy and rejoicing, you're going to get filled with more hope. And as you hope in God, you're going to be filled with joy and rejoicing. And as you get more joy and rejoicing, you're going to be filled with hope. Do you see how this works? Hope expectingly. Now put all of this in context. The Roman Christians are probably wondering... Is there any way that we're ever going to be able to get along? Is there any way that we're going to be able to, to set aside these differences and focus on what really matters? And God says, yes. Love others. Stop trying to please yourself. Hey, follow Jesus. He didn't come to please himself. He took the reproaches of one another. Hey, learn from scripture. Pray accordingly. And then hope in the hope of who God is. And make no mistake about it. You can be united. And you can glorify God with one mouth and one voice. And you can be everything that the world created you to be. I mean, that I created you to be for the world. And you know where this really hits home with me? Is that if we want to taste the heaven on earth... It's not going to come from going back out here and having our 4th of July picnics that we're going to have this week and taking our vacations and making more money in our jobs and building bigger houses and driving better cars. It's not going to come from that kind of stuff. The more you have, you're just going to want more and more and more, and it's never going to be satisfying and it's never going to be fulfilling. But when we hope for the things that God truly wants us to hope for, when we recognize that there are people that are in desperate need of Jesus, when we're willing to set aside our differences so that we can be like-minded around the gospel and the needs of this world, and we serve one another, we get outside of our walls like our teenagers did, and we get out in our community and we love and we sacrifice and we pay a price, oh, all of a sudden, you'll start seeing God moving and working and you'll start tasting and experiencing heaven on earth.